Osteoidosteoma is a benign bone-forming neoplasm that most commonly affects children and adolescents and is seen up to four times more common in males than in females. Histologically, osteoid osteoma looks essentially identical to another entity called osteoblastoma, and the only thing that differentiates between these two benign bone tumors is their proliferative potential, which is best reflected in their different, different sizes. And there is a size cutoff of two centimeters, with osteoid osteoma being, per definition, less than two centimeters in size, and osteoblastoma, that has, which has a bigger, a stronger, a higher proliferative potential, is more locally aggressive, and is typically more than two centimeters in size. So it's important to remember the size cutoff. And this is, um, this is a reflection of one of the thousand reasons of why you cannot practice bone pathology without knowing your imaging findings for that particular bone lesion, without doing radiological pathological correlation. And maybe you'll be surprised to know that among the plethora of new and advanced imaging modalities that we have um, nowadays at our disposal to evaluate bone lesions, the standard, most the golden standard for the pathologist at least, in most situations remains the plain radiograph. And if you're able as a pathologist to access imaging findings and to in, most, most importantly to um, interpret the radiological findings of a bone lesion yourself, in most situations, you'll have all the prerequisites to reach a correct diagnosis. Now, the typical clinical vignette of an, a case of osteoosteoma will, in a board-style question, will, will sound something like a young male with a small, less than two centimeters in size, lytic, well-circumscribed lesion with surrounding bone sclerosis in the mid-tibial diaphysis, presenting with pain that is worsening at night and is relieved by NSAIDs. And that's because osteoidosteoma is most commonly, most frequently, in about 50% of cases, if not more, affect the long bones of the extremities, and especially the mid-tibial diaphysis, as well as the neck of the femur. Another second most common localization for osteoidosteomas are the small tubular bones of the hand and feet. Rarely, they affect the posterior elements of the spine, and they may also be very rarely seen in flat bones and in craniofacial bones. They are in about 75% of cases cortical-based, and in 25% of cases they're intramedullary in location. Uh, and on plain film, they usually they present as an ovoid, well-circumscribed lytic lesion. This is called the central nidus, which is surrounded by an area of dense reactive bone sclerosis. And this is something that you'll see in most benign bone tumors. It's a sign of the tumor being having a uh, limited growth potential. It is um, typically seen in benign, slow-growing bone tumors. Essentially, the surrounding bone has time to react and tries to contain the lesion, so it becomes sclerotic. And in an osteoidosteoma that is cortical-based, you may see um, solid periosteal reaction with cortical thickening, and in a tumor that will be intramedullary, you will see reactive bone marrow sclerosis. But the tumor itself is represented by that central nidus that is um, osteolytic in nature. Sometimes the bone sclerosis can be so hefty, so strong, that may, it may actually obscure the central nidus on plain film. And this is a sort of situation where clinically a CT imaging um, may be better suited to highlight that central nidus. Now, you won't see much at cross-examination because nowadays we don't usually get resection specimens that often. Uh, more conservative approaches are now being used. So resection specimens are, for osteoidosteomas at least, are pretty rare. But if you would see one, you would have a central lesion that is well circumscribed and has gritty red cut surface surrounded by dense bone sclerosis. And this is what you'll see under the microscope. This is a spe specimen showing the central nidus of an osteoidosteoma. We have here parts of the normal sclerotic lamellar bone, and then the central nidus, which consists of anastomosing microtrabeculi of woven bone, that is immature bone, with variable degrees of mineralization. This is reflected in this heterogeneous look of the woven bone with more eosinophilic areas and some areas that look more basophilic. These are the mineralized areas. Sometimes you may see, may see more prominent mineralization or completely unmineralized woven bone. And this woven bone is rimmed by a single layer of well, um, like mature, cytologically bland osteoblasts. There is no cytological atypia in these cells. You may see scattered some um, osteoclastic giant cells. Sometimes they are more numerous as opposed to this example. 
And all of this is set in this loose connective tissue, sometimes um, blatantly hemorrhagic. It is well vascularized, as we can see here, and shows these bland fibroblast-like spindle cells. There is no cytological atypia, there are no increased mitotic figures, and there is no cartilaginous differentiation. Uncommonly, the um, new bone is deposited not in this microtrabecular pattern, but in a more, more diffuse sheet-like pattern that can cause some diagnostic difficulty. But the imaging findings are typical, and you always have to correlate your microscopic findings with the imaging findings. On a molecular level, osteoid osteomats sh show in about 90% of cases rearrangements involving the FOS gene. And the tumor cells actually produce prostaglandins, especially PGE2 and PGI2, through the COX-2 enzyme. And this leads to that characteristic pain syndrome and its particular responsiveness to NSAIDs that we have mentioned earlier. There are no immunohistochemical stains to make this diagnosis. This is a purely histological and imaging-based diagnosis. And the prognosis is excellent. These tumors sometimes show spontaneous regression. And recurrences are rare and are mostly linked to incomplete surgical excision. They may be sometimes problematic because they may be situated in sites that are surgically inaccessible or um, hardly accessible. They may also cause uh, functional impairment, especially when they're located in the fingers. So they may be problematic in this sense. So in summary, remember, osteoid osteomas are benign. They are by definition less than two centimeters in size. Otherwise, they're an osteoblastoma. They show rearrangements in the FOS gene. Remember the clinical vignette, most commonly seen in young, skeletally immature males. Small, under two centimeters, well circumscribed lytic lesion in the mid-tibial diaphysis, cortically based in most cases, patient presenting with pain, worsening at night, relieved by NSAIDs. On radiography, the central well-defined uh, nidus or a central lucency surrounded by dense reactive bone sclerosis. On histopathology, anastomosing trabeculae of woven bone with variable degrees of mineralization, rimmed by a single layer of cytologically bland osteoblasts plus minus some osteoclastic giant cells set in a loose and highly vascularized um, connective tissue with fibroblast-like spindle cells, and that's it. Hope you've enjoyed the video.